we're finally ready to start. We have uh, Volker Krause here with uh, a privacy by design travel assistant, and it's going to be about building open source travel assistance, I think. And uh, this talk will be in English. And if you want translations, when you have a Deutsch Übersetzung haben wollt, haben wir hinten auch ganz um, tolle Übersetzer in unserer Kabine. Da könnt ihr auf c3lingo.org mal reinhören, uh, wie die alles live mitreden. Genau. Now, uh, let's have a warm welcome for Volker here and have fun with his talk. Thank you. Okay, so what is this about? Um, you probably know those um, features in, in most prominently Google Mail, but uh, I think TripIt was the one that pioneered this. Um, so Gmail reads your email and then detects any kind of booking information in there, like um, your boarding passes, your train tickets, your hotel bookings, and so on. And it can integrate that into to your calendar um, and it can present your unified itinerary uh, for your entire trip and monitor that for for changes um, and all of that doesn't cost you anything um, maybe apart from a bit of your privacy well not too bad you might think um, but if we look at what kind of data is actually involved in, in just your travel, right? Um, the, the obvious things that come to mind, um, your name, your birthday, your credit card number, your passport number, that kind of information, right? Um, but that isn't even the, the worst part on this, um, because those operators don't just get to see your specific data for one trip, right? they get to see every, everyone's trip. And now if you combine that information, that actually uncovers a lot of information about um, relations between people, um, your interests, who you work for, where you live, and, and all of that, right? So pretty much everyone here traveled to Leipzig for the last four days in the year, right? If that... Um, if that happens for two of us once, right, that might be coincidence. If that happens two or three years in a row, that is some kind of information. Um, but yeah, what to do about that, right? The, the easy solution is um, just not use those services. Um, it's like first world luxury stuff anyway. Um, that works until you end up in a foreign country where you don't speak any of the local languages and then get introduced to their counterpart of Schienenersatzverkehr or Tarifzonenrandgebiet. And at that point, you might be interested in actually understanding what's happening on your, your trip in, in some form um, that you actually understand and that you are familiar with. Ideally, without installing 15 different render applications for wherever you actually might, might be traveling, right? So we need something better. Um, and that obviously leads us to let's do it ourselves. Um, then we can at least design this for privacy right from the start, build it on top of free software and open data. Um, well, of course, we need to at, at least it's not entirely obvious that this will actually work, right? The Google and Apple, they have a total different um, amount of resources available for this, so can we actually build this ourselves? Um, so let's have a look at what those services actually need to function. Um, and it turns out it's primarily about um, about data, not so much about code. Um, there are some, some difficult parts in, in terms of code involved as well, like the image processing in a PDF to detect a barcode in your boarding pass, but all of that exists as ready-made building blocks, so we, we basically just need to put this nicely together. Um, so let's look at the, the data, that's the more interesting part. And in general, that that breaks down to three different categories. 
Um, the first one is what I call personal data here. So that's basically booking information, documents, or um, tickets, boarding passes specific for you. So there at least you don't have a problem with access because that is sent to you and you need to have access to that. Um, but it comes in all kinds of forms and shapes. So um, there are the challenges to actually extract that. Um, the second kind of data is um, what I would call static data. So, for example, the location of an airport. Now, you could argue that that could change, and there is rumors that some people apparently managed to build new airports. I live in Berlin, so I don't believe this. Um, jokes aside, so... Um, Static refers to within, static within the release cycle of the software, right? So several weeks or a few months. So this is stuff that we can ship as offline databases. And offline, of course, helps us with privacy because then you're not observable from the outside. And the third category is um, dynamic data. So stuff that is very, very short-lived, um, such as delay information. Um, there is no way we can do that offline, right? If we want that kind of information, we will always need some kind of online querying. Um, then let's look through those three categories um, in a bit more detail. Um, for the booking data, um, Google was faced with the same problem. So they used their monopoly and defined a standard in which um, operators should ideally have machine-readable annotations on their booking information. And that's awesome because we can just use the same, the same system. Um, that's what nowadays became uh, schema.org, which I think uh, Lucas mentioned in the morning as well. Um, at least in the, in the US and Europe, you find that in about 30 to 50 percent of uh, booking emails you get from hotels, airlines, or um, event um, brokers, so that's a good start. Um, but then there's the rest, which is basically unstructured data, um, random PDF files or HTML emails uh, we have to work with. Um, there's Apple Wallet boarding passes. They are somewhat semi-structured and um, most widespread for, um, for flight tickets. Um, well, that's somewhat usable. Um, and then barcodes, so that's what you, again, see on boarding passes or, uh, or train tickets. Um, I could probably fill an entire talk just with the various details on, uh, on the different barcode systems. Um, the one for uh, boarding passes, I think Carsten Noll had a talk at Congress a few years back um, where he showed how they work and what you can do with them. Um, Instagram hashtag boarding pass is a, a very nice source of test data. Um, the one that you find on, on German railway tickets is also pretty much um, researched already. Um, the ones we actually had to break ourselves were the, the one for Italy. I think, to my knowledge, we are the first ones who published the, the content of those binary barcodes. Um, and we are currently working on the um, VDV Kernapplikation e-Ticket, which is the standard for German local transportation tickets. Um, that actually has some crypto that you need to get around to actually see the content. So there's, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, um, there is uh, quite some interesting detail to be found in, in this. Um, but let's continue with the, um, the static data. Um, there, of course, we have um, Wikidata that has almost everything uh, uh, we need. And that we are making heavy use of that. And that's also why I'm, I'm here today on the uh, Wikimedia stage. Um, one thing that Wikidata um, doesn't do perfectly is time zone information. That's why we are using the OpenStreetMap data um, uh, for this. Um, there's in Wikidata three different 
time zone or ways of specifying the time zone, UTC offsets, some kind of coarse human readable naming like Central European summertime, and then the actual IA, IANA uh, time zone specifications like Europe slash Berlin. And that's the one we actually need because they contain um, daylight saving time transitions. And that is actually crucial for, for travel assistance because you can have a flight from, say, the US to Europe at the night where there is a daylight saving time transition on one end. And if we get that wrong, right, we are off by one hour, and that could mean you miss your flight. So that, that we need to get absolutely right. Um, and Wikidata there mixes the three time zone variations. So um, that's why we fall back to OpenStreetMap there. Um, another area that, that still needs work um, is vendor-specific station identifiers. So there's a number of train companies that have their own numeric identifier or alphanumeric identifiers, which you find, for example, in barcodes of, of tickets. So that's our way to actually find out where people are traveling. So that's something we are trying to feed into Wikidata as we get our hands on those identifiers. Um, for airports, that's easy because they are internationally standardized. For train stations, that's a bit more messy. Um, and finally, the dynamic data. That's again an area where we benefit from uh, Google using their monopoly. They wanted to have um, uh, local public transportation information in Google Maps. So they defined the GTFS format, um, which is a way for local transport operators to send their schedules to, um, to Google. Um, but most of the time, that is done in a way that they basically publish this as open data. Um, and that way, all of us get access to it. Um, and then there's uh, Navizia, which is a free software implementation of a, like a routing and journey query service that consumes all of those open data schedule information. And that then, in turn, we can use again um, to yeah, find out departure schedules, delays, and, and that kind of live information. Um, Apple Wallet also has some kind of live updating polling mechanism, uh, but that is somewhat dangerous because it leaks uh, uh, personal identifiable information. So the basically a unique identifier for your pass is sent out with the API request to, to pull an update. So that is uh, basically just a last resort mechanism if we have nothing else. Um, and then there's a bunch of vendor-specific, more or less proprietary APIs that we could use. Um, they are unfortunately not often compatible with uh, free software and open source. Because, uh, they might require API keys that you're not allowed to share, um, or they have terms and conditions that are simply incompatible with what we are trying to do. So um, for some, this works, but um, there's still some, some room for improvement in those vendors understanding the value of proper open data access. OK, so that's the theory. Um, let's have a look at what we have actually built uh, for this. So there's um, two um, yeah, backend components, so to say. There's um, the extraction library um, that implements the, the schema.org data model for, for flights, for trains, uh, for hotels, for restaurants, and for events. Um, it can do the structured data um, extraction. That might sound easy at first, but um, it turns out that for some of the operators, um, doing proper JSON array encoding is somewhat hard. So, I mean, you need to, do a, need to have a comma in between two objects and brackets around it. Um, some of them struggle with that, so we have to have lots of workarounds in, in parsing um, the, the data we receive. Um, 
Then we have an unstructured extraction system that's basically uh, small scripts per, um, per provider or per operator um, that then yeah, use regular expressions or XPath queries depending on the input and turn that into our data model. Um, we currently, I think, have slightly more than 50 of those. Um, I know that Apple has about 600, so that is still one order of magnitude more, but it's not impossible, right? So um, uh, I think we, we have the means there with free software to, to come to a similar um, result than people that have an Apple or Google scale budget for this. Um, the service coverage is actually quite different. So f for Apple, I've seen their, their custom extractors. So they, they have a lot of like US car rental services. Um, we have somewhat more important stuff like um, CCC tickets. So the, the Congress ticket is actually recognized and I managed to get in with the, the app. Um, what the extraction engine also does is it augments whatever we find in the input documents by information we have from Wikidata. So we usually have time zones, countries, geo coordinates, all that useful stuff for then offering assistance features on top. Um, yeah, and input formats is basically everything I, uh, I mentioned. Um, the usual stuff you get in, in an email from, from a transport operator or any kind of booking document. Um, the second piece on like on backend components is the uh, public transportation library. That's basically a client API for, for Navizia mainly, um, but also for some of the uh, proprietary widespread backends like Hafas, that's the, the stuff Deutsche Bahn is using. Um, and it can aggregate the results from multiple backends. And uh, if we are using open data in a backend, it, it propagates the, um, the attribution information correctly. So, um, and just a few days ago, it also gained uh, support for querying uh, train and platform layouts, so uh, Wagenstandsanzeiger in, in German. Uh, so we can have all of that um, in the app. And then, of course, there is the KDE itinerary app um, itself. Um, so it has a, um, oh, it's very hard to read here. It's basically a, um, a timeline with the various uh, booking information you have grouped together by, by trip. It can insert the um, live weather information. Um, again, that's online access, so it's optional, but uh, it's kind of useful. Um, and this is, you probably can't read that, but that's my uh, train to Leipzig this morning, and that's actually the Congress entry ticket. Um, and the box at the top is the, um, the collapsible group for my trip to Leipzig for, uh, for Congress. Um, and it can show the actual um, tickets and, and, and barcodes, including Apple wallet passes. So if uh, you sometimes have a, like a manual inspection at an airport where they don't scan your bar, um, boarding pass, but look at it, uh, apparently that looks reasonable enough that um, you can board an aircraft with it. Um, at least I wasn't arrested so far. Um, and then we have uh, one of my favorite features, um, also powered by Wikidata. It's the power plug incompatibility warning. So, I mean, if you're traveling to, say, the US or UK, you are probably aware that they have, like, incompatible power plugs. Um, but there's some, some countries where this isn't, at least to me, isn't that obvious, like Switzerland or Italy. Um, where only half of my power plugs work. So this is the Italy example. It tells me that my Shuko plugs won't work, only my Euro plugs. And the other one. And the, uh, the right one is, uh, I think, for the UK, um, where nothing is compatible. If you occasionally forget your power plug converter when, while traveling, 
that is uh, super useful. Um, and then, of course, we have the integration with, uh, with real-time data. Um, so um, we can show the delay information and, and platform changes. Um, the part in the middle is the alternative connection selection for, for trains. So if you have a, like a train ticket that isn't bound to a specific um, connection, right, then the app lets you pick the one you actually want to take. Or if you're missing a connection, you need to move to a different train. Uh, you can do that right in the app as well. Um, the screenshot on the right hand side is the um, like your overall travel statistics. So if you're interested in like seeing the carbon impact of, of all your trips and the year over year changes, right? The app shows that to you. And um, I wasn't really successful, but that's largely because the old data isn't complete. Um, so if you're interested in that, right, um, since we have all the data, that can help you see if, if you're actually on the right track there. Um, and then to get data into that, we also have uh, a plugin for email clients. Um, this one is for, for Kmail. Um, so it basically then runs the extraction on, on the email you're currently looking at, and it uh, shows you a summary of what's in there. Uh, in this case, my uh, my train to Leipzig this morning, um, including the option to add that to the calendar or send it to the app uh, on the phone. Um, we also have the browser extension. Um, so this is the website of the yearly KDE conference, which has the schema.org annotations on it. And the browser extension recognizes that and again offers me to, um, to add that um, either to my calendar or to the itinerary app. Um, and that also works on, on many restaurant websites or um, event websites. Um, they have those annotations on the website for the Google search. So again, we benefit a bit from the uh, Google. Um, OK, then we get to the more experimental stuff um, that basically just was finished in the last couple of days um, that we haven't sh shown anywhere else publicly yet. Um, the first one is, uh, and that's a bit better to read at least, um, if you saw the, the timeline earlier, right, it had my train booking to Leipzig and then the Congress ticket. But that still leaves two gaps, right? I need to get from home to the station in Berlin and I need to get from the station in Leipzig to Congress. Um, and what we have now is a way for the app to automatically recognize those gaps and fill them with suggestions on what kind of local transport you could take. So here the, the one for Leipzig to, to Congress is expanded and shows the, um, the tram. Um, that still needs some work to, to do live tracking so that it accounts for delays and changes your alarm clock in the morning if there's delays on that, on that trip. Um, but we have all the building blocks to, um, to make the whole thing much more smart in, in this area now. Um, and that, I think, was literally done yesterday. Um, so that's why the graphics still are um, very basic. Um, that's the uh, train layout, coach layout uh, display for, uh, for your trip, um, so that you know where your reserved seat on the train can actually be found. Um, then I only showed the KML plugin so far. We also have um, a work in progress uh, Thunderbird integration, which is probably the much more widespread um, email client. Uh, feature wise, more or less uh, the same I, I showed for KML. So it, it scans the email and displays you a summary and offers you to put that into the app or possibly uh, later on also into the calendar. Um, this one is even more experimental. I can only show you a screenshot of um, Weapon Spectra proving that it managed to extract something. Um, that's the integration with Nextcloud. Um, 
I hope we'll have uh, an actual working prototype for this uh, in January then. Um, those two things are, of course, important for, for you to even get to the data, the booking data that then the app or other tools you build on top um, uh, can consume. Okay, so um, where to get this from? Um, there's the, um, the wiki link up there. Um, the app is currently not yet in the um, Play Store or in the Ftroid master repository. We have an Ftroid nightly built repository. Um, I hope that within the next month we'll get um, actual official releases in the easier to reach uh, stores than, than what we have right now. Um, if you're interested in helping with that, um, there's some stuff in, in Wikidata where improvement on the data directly benefits um, this work and that is um, specifically around um, train stations. Um, I think in Germany last time I checked we still had a few hundred train stations that didn't have geo coordinates or uh, even a human readable label. So um, that is something to look at um, vendor specific or even the more or less standard train station identifiers is something to look at. So UIC or IBNR codes for, for train stations that helps a lot. Um, yeah, and then we kind of need test data for the extraction, so forget everything I saw the, uh, said about privacy. If you have um, any kind of booking documents or emails you want to donate to support this and get the providers you're using um, supported in, in the extraction engine, um, talk to me. Um, that would be extremely useful. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hello, hello. Yeah. That's a very impressive project, I think. Do we have questions? Then I'll hand you my microphone. Yes. Uh, would it be possible to extract platform lift data for train stations? Sorry, platform? Platform lift data. Oh, um, I think Deutsche Bahn has an open data API for the uh, live status of lifts. Um, that would, of course, in theory be possible. Um, what we are trying to do is to be generic enough so that this might not be applicable in just one country. Um, although it is very European uh, focused because most of the team is there. Um, but Lyft is something that is easy enough to generalize in a data model, right? It's location on the platform and are they working or not? Um, so yeah, that, that would be a nice addition. Um, that goes into the entire direction of um, yeah, indoor navigation or navigation around larger train stations and, and airports. So that's probably something where we could use a um, better overall display with the OpenStreetMap data and then augment that with like the um, where exactly is your train stopping and in which coach is your seat and then have the lift data so we can basically guide you to the right place um, in, a, in a better way. Yep. Any more questions? Yes. Is the mobile app uh, written in, in Qt um, as well? Yes. Um, most of this is uh, C++ code because that's what we use at KDE. Um, the, um, the mobile client as well. There is a bit of Java for platform integration with Android. Um, I don't think anyone has ever tried to build it on iOS, uh, but of course it works on Linux-based mobile platforms as well, um, thanks to, to Qt and C++. Yeah. So you mostly talked about the mobile app so far, which is understandable, but uh, as it's a QML application, uh, does it also run on desktop? And a second question, uh, how, do, how do all the plugins and the different instances of, uh, uh, of the app uh, share their data? 
Um, so yes, the app runs on desktop. I was trying to see if I can actually start it here. Um, not sure on which screen it will end up. Um, that's where we do most of the development. Um, let me see if I can move it over. Oh, thank you. And now I need to find my mouse cursor on the two screens. Uh, I think I need to end the presentation first. Um, but yeah, short answer, of course. There, there we go. Uh, let me switch to to. Uh, yep. So that's it running on on desktop. It has a mobile UI there. Um, that could, of course, be extended to be more useful um, on the desktop as well. Um, and in terms of storage, that is currently internal to the app. Um, there is no second process accessing the actual data storage. Um, that would just unnecessarily complicate it for now. But if there is a use for that, yeah, we'll need to see. But but there but there was an option uh, in the email plugins, for example, to send it to the app. Can I then only send it to my local app and not to the mobile app? Oh, um, the send to app um, that's using KD Connect. That's an integration software that allows you to remote control your phone from the desktop. So that's basically bundling up all the information and sends it to the app on the phone, oh, and or it can import it locally. So, okay, do we have other questions? Again, no, we don't have time. So then, thank you very much, Falka. Maybe you can tell people where they can find you if they have anything more they want to talk about. But um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, my email address, and otherwise I'll be around um, all day, uh, all four days. Around um, where can you? Congress okay. somewhere, so, so yeah, that is a bit tricky. Um, catch him before he <laughs> runs away then. All right, so give a round of applause again, and thank you, Farka.